Welcome back to Gettysburg 159. I'm Evan Portman with the American Battlefield Trust, standing out here kind of between the Pennsylvania Monument and the Trossel Farm. We have a video about the Trossel Farm and about some of the, uh, the artillerists that are out there that are buying some time for General Daniel Sickles' men to withdraw through this position as he's uh, being pursued by uh, General Barksdale's men and some of the other Confederate brigades coming through here. So we're out here on kind of this shelf and we're looking towards Cemetery Ridge, which is right in front of me. And Lieutenant Colonel Freeman McGilvery's line of artillery uh, would be up here along with some of uh, the men from the 5th Corps, some of the artillery reserve that General Meade is trying to draw from to shore up this line and to save Sickles from destruction. So we have uh, Mr. Doug Dowds here with us again today. So welcome him, and he's going to talk a little more about this. Thanks so much. He, I, I love that he introduced it. He's so composed and so... I, I'm used to following Gary, and then when I talk, it seems like I'm talking slow. So this <laughs> seems like I'm talking fast, but here's what happens. Well, as we try and band-aid together a, a defensive line back behind us, batteries are being used to try and create time. We just talked about Bigelow's battery over there by the Trossel Farm. During this time, Melbourne Watson's 5th uh, uh, U.S. Battery I is going to show up. It's only four guns, and they're not going to be here for very long. Now, truth be told, we're standing on this position, but they were actually on the other side of the road because the road was further to the south, and they were in front of the trees. Effectively, they arrive about the same time the 21st Mississippi is slamming into Bigelow's battery. Battery. In fact, if we read the account after the 21st Mississippi captures Bigelow's battery, about the time they get down to the swale below us, they're going to deliver volley. And in that first volley, Melbourne Watson will be hitting the leg. It'll spin around and be dropped. This battery will only fire about 20 rounds before the 21st Mississippi realize that's another battery they can capture, and they'll be headed this way. Fortunately, 2nd Lieutenant McConnell takes command of the battery, and what he's going to do is order all the men to gather all the accoutrements, the rammer staffs, the hand spikes, the thumb shawls, all that, and what they're going to do is they're going to retreat back, they're going to abandon the guns. In fact, what just so happens that one of the lieutenants assigned to Melbourne Watson's battery is a Lieutenant Samuel Peeper. Now, Peoples is supposed to be, normally, up with Hazlitt's battery up on Little Round Top. He's going to go back and try and find somebody to save him. He runs into two brigade commanders and asks them. They're busy trying to band-aid together a line. In fact, he's standing up on a rock when Captain Fassett will ride by, notice his artillerist uniform, and say, hey, shouldn't you be with the battery? And he goes, I would be, but if you don't help me take my battery back, those things are going to be taken before you can get this line fixed. And with that, Fassett will ride to the next closest infantry regiment he can find, and it's the 39th New York, known as the Garibaldi Guards. Early in the war, they decided they were going to put together a regiment made up of all immigrants, so a company of Italians, a company of Greeks, a company of Swiss, a company of Poles and Mexican Indians, and five companies of German, Dutch, and Greeks. In fact, they gave all the commands in German. At this point, though, it's commanded by Major Hugo Hildebrandt, and it's only four companies strong, about 268 men. In fact, Fassett will ride up to Hildebrandt and say, hey, I command you to go ahead and take that battery. And he goes, under whose orders? He goes, well, I I'm the aide for General Bernie. It's under General Bernie's orders. And Hugo Hildebrandt looks at him and says, I'm not in the Third Corps. And he goes, oh, so uh, I, I order you to take that battery in the com under the command of General Hancock. And he goes, very well. And with that, Hugo Hildebrandt and the 39th New York will charge out here. They will recapture the guns about the same time that uh, Colonel Humphreys of the 21st Mississippi has realized they have climaxed for their day and they're about to fall back. But they will recapture the four guns of Melbourne Watson's battery, and they will also advance to where Bigelow's battery is to help secure those. But ultimately, this is going to be another case of just buying a precious few moments on July 2nd to allow a defensive line to set up back in Cemetery Ridge as this whole position in front of us is collapsing. This is an effort late in the day of the Union Army to react to the Third Corps' advance position and now create a position back on Cemetery Ridge that they might have just enough time to go ahead and set that up before the Confederates can reach it. Melbourne and Watson's battery is a part of that story. So if we think about this, though, they're not alone. These guys are 5th Corps batteries, and you're like, wait a minute. We've got artillery reserve batteries out here. We've got 3rd Corps batteries out here. We've got 5th Corps batteries out here. Yes, organization is going to fall apart. It's at some point where George Sykes doesn't even really have a corps to command because we're appealing bits and pieces. Imagine, you know, the dam is starting to burst, and you're trying to plug each hole by putting a unit here or there. The same would happen with the 6th Corps. This is truly a band-aiding together of the unit line using whatever is available right now in 
order to make this happen. It's why ultimately the first Minnesota from the second core is going to charge across this field. Willard's Brigade is going to charge out here. Their second core, they came from all the way up by Cemetery Hill. So this is reflective of all that is taking place. And when we think about the time that this happens, it's one of those moments when the field gets very small and you go, okay, well, what is happening about 6.30 in the evening? Oh, 6.30 in the evening? Little Round Top starting to come to a close. Devil's Den has just collapsed. Uh, Wofford's Brigade is rolling through the uh, wheat field. Uh, this position is just starting to happen as we have additional brigades from Wilcox and Lang and Wright's Georgians coming across the field. It is the climactic end of what is arguably, well, what James Longstreet would call the greatest three hours of fighting done by any corps on any field of battle. Good, good. And let me note that not everybody took this sort of separation of uh, unit well together. In fact, Augustus P. Martin, in charge of the 5th Corps artillery himself, um, actually said that General Sickle shanghaied his artillery brigade. Evan? Wow, that's that's interesting. I I've never heard that before. And thanks, Doug, for um, some of those great stories, which I think uh, when we kind of zoom into this, like, you know, person by person, regiment by regiment battle, that becomes almost more of a, a compelling story. You know, you can talk about like the, the generals and the tactics and the strategy, but when you talk about the experience of the common soldier or the common person, you can really empathize with the people that, that were here in 1863. So Gary, do you have anything else to add? No, just thank you everybody for watching and thank you for supporting Battlefield Preservation and Education. That is unless Doug has something to add here. No, but thanks for supporting American Battlefield Trust.